We belong to you, Lord. You have started a fire in our heart, Lord, and we want that fire to stay charged up, Lord. We are here to serve you, Lord, to serve your people, Lord, and to go out into this lost and fallen world, Lord, and fulfill your great commission. So we thank you for each and every opportunity. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. And so the title of today's message is Fired Up for Jesus. And the foundational verse that we'll be in today is Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. Messages. We've been in the Firestarter series now for a while. You know, this is message number 11. This is part number 11. Sometimes messages can be too long. Earlier this year at one of the better known Catholic universities, uh, Yale University, the head bishop had all the students come into the university on the first day of school. Freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors, the whole faculty came in. He put that same logo that you see up there, he put that logo up onto the screen. And then he spoke for 30 minutes on how the Y in Yale stood for youth. Another 30 minutes on how the A stood for academics and achievement. Spoke for 30 more minutes on how the L stood for leadership. And 30 more minutes on how the E stood for energy and enthusiasm. So after two hours of this, right, anybody in that stadium that was still awake was, was you know, simply bored to tears, right? But as he was wrapping it up, this one lone student got up out of his seat, walked to the front of the stage, knelt down, and began to pray. The bishop was totally impressed. He left the stage, went and knelt down in front of the student. When the student was done praying, he asked him, son, what was it that I said that moved you so? The young man looked up at the bishop. He then pointed toward the screen and said, actually, bishop, I was just thanking God this wasn't the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. <laughs> Yes, messages are like that, man. They can be too long sometimes. Sometimes they're too short. We're doing the the Firestarter series today, right? Sometimes messages can be so fiery, they give you a heartburn, you know? But, But I'm hoping that today's message doesn't give you heartburn. I want it to give you a burning heart because we're going to continue to talk today about God's fire. The title of the message, again, is Fired Up for Jesus. So let me ask you this question today. Are you fired up for Jesus? Throughout the centuries, people have debated, nations, cultures, people, even people who call themselves Christians, they've debated, why did Jesus come? What was the purpose for the incarnation? God in the flesh. And of course, Jesus himself, he answers that question several times in the Gospels. Right here, John 10.10. He says, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. When Jesus says life right there, he's talking about eternal life. When he says more abundantly, he's talking about our lives right here, right now. We can walk through a a right walk in more abundance of his peace and of his joy. In the book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10, Jesus says, The Son of Man has came to seek and to save the lost. Uh, uh, maybe it's supposed to say he has come to seek and save that what was lost. I don't know. But anyway, if I asked you today what was lost, your answer might be mankind. But the truth is everything was lost. Everything. There's a scientific field called thermodynamics. And in the scientific field of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics is that everything in this universe is deteriorating. From the time we're born, we're growing old, man. We're deteriorating. The book of Matthew, chapter 20, verse 28, he says, the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. We say it all the time. He paid a debt he didn't owe because we owed a debt we couldn't pay. See, we are the problem. He is the solution. You know, over the last few decades, there's been these bywords that have gone around. It started just a couple of decades ago. The, the first one I remember was politically correct, right? Everything was going to be politically correct and, and everything except Jesus. The next one was tolerance, right? We heard about tolerance. Everything's tolerated except for Jesus, except for God's word. The next one was inclusionism. Everything was included Except Jesus, again, except Christianity. The new word today that I'm hearing more of than any other word when I turn on my TV or open my newspaper is entitlement. People are walking around and they feel like they're entitled. Man. Some people feel like they're entitled because of where they were born. Others feel like they're entitled because of what they have or maybe something they've done. Other people, they feel entitled because of what they don't have. 
Some people today feel entitled. They think they're entitled just because of, of simply who they are. So if, if that's you today and you think you're entitled, I'm going to say these two words to you. And I want you to love me when I say these two words, okay? If my mom was here, she'd say, okay, you can go ahead and say that, but don't say it in a smart alecky kind of way. That's what you say. So if you think you're entitled today, these are the two words. Think again. <laughs> We are not entitled, man. We owe everything to God. We owe everything to the giver of every good and perfect gift. The scripture said that everything is made by him and for him. The scripture says he bought us with a price. That means we are bond slaves. That's what the scripture calls us, bond slaves to Jesus. Now, you're probably aware of the scriptures I just read. You're probably aware of a lot of the things I just said. But did you know that Jesus himself said, I came to bring fire on the earth, and it's in our foundational verses today. Luke chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. I came to bring fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to undergo. And then Jesus says, how distressed I am until it is completed. At this point in the book of Luke, Jesus is just weeks away from the time he's going to go up to Jerusalem, where he's going to be betrayed, arrested, tortured, and crucified. There was a fire that he brought to earth, and he's wishing that this fire had already been kindled. But he says here, because this fire hadn't been ignited yet, that he was going to have to endure a baptism. And this was going to be a baptism of suffering, right? You and I, when we say baptism, we're usually thinking of water baptism, right? Like we did last week out at the uh, Teen Challenge Ranch. But, the, but baptism, what the actual definition of baptism is to be immersed. Jesus realized that in just a few short weeks, he is going to be immersed in agonizing pain and torture. But I want to say this to you right here. Jesus wasn't scared. Jesus wasn't afraid. He knew what he had to do. He was willing to do that because he loves you and I so much. But when he would take on the sins of the world, past, present, and future, all of our sins, their sins back there, the future sins that are coming, it meant that for a short time, he would be separated from the Father. And that caused Jesus to be distressed. That actually caused him agony. He didn't like it. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he sweated blood. He said to the Father, Father, if this cup can pass from me, let it pass. But he loves us so much, he was willing to do what he had to do. Now, in our verse, it also says that he is distressed until it is completed. What he's talking about there when he says until it is completed, he's talking about the advent. He has come, right? You and I, we're in the middle of the advent. We're in the middle of this thing that's called the age of grace. That's why he came to bring a fire. We're the body of Christ now, and our job in this advent is to keep spreading that fire to other people, to let people know the power of God, the healing power of Almighty God. In the, in the scriptures, it gives this wonderful analogy of Jesus as the bridegroom and you and I, believers, the ecclesia, the church, the called out people of God. It calls us the bride, right? So using that analogy, I want to tell you where I believe that we are today as the bride of Christ. I just finished doing a wedding last week. I'm going to do another wedding next week and another wedding the week after that. The spring and the fall, I'm going to do a lot of weddings, right? So at a wedding in the natural, right, the groom, he comes to the church on his wedding day and he walks around the church and he greets people. And then when it's time for the wedding, he ascends up to the altar, right? He comes up to the altar, he usually stands right about here, right? Well, Jesus, he came to this earth, our, our bridegroom, born of a virgin. He walked this earth. At age 30, he began his earthly ministry. Three years later, he would be crucified on the cross. Three days after that, he would rise again, conquering death and the grave. And again, walk this earth for 40 days for over 500 people to see. The scripture says that then he ascended to that heavenly altar to heaven, where he even now stands at God's right hand, praying and interceding. For us, he longs to be with us physically. He's with us spiritually by the power of the Holy Spirit, but he longs to be with us physically, just like we do him. Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. Paul says that we are well pleased to be absent from this flesh and to be present with God. Oh, some of the bridesmaids and the, and the groomsmen, they've already ascended to the altar, just like in the natural. Our loved ones and our friends, they've already gone. Their, their spirits, their souls are with Jesus now, right? And they await, like you and I do, that bodily 
resurrection when we're all going to be together physically, in the physical, with our Lord. In the natural, a bride, if everything goes the way it's supposed to go, her father's going to walk her down that aisle. And give her away to the groom. Jesus refers to you and I, his disciples, when he talks about us to the Father. He refers to us as, Father, those that you have given to me. And the Father says the day we receive Jesus into our hearts, his Holy Spirit, his fire comes to live in us. So even though we're walking down that aisle towards God, he's with us every step of the way. That aisle, it represents that straight and narrow path that the Bible talks about that leads to heaven. In the natural, if a bride would stumble coming down the aisle, people would jump up to her rescue. They would help her to regain her footing. In those pews, man, in this spiritual wedding, there's believers sitting there. If we stumble, we bear one another's burdens. We jump up and help each other. But there's also people sitting there that don't know the groom. They're wondering, man, what does the bride see in him? And just hopefully, they're going to nudge that believer sitting next to him and say, hey, why does the bride... Love the groom so much. What does she see in him? And then discipleship is going to begin. Church, I believe that the bride of Christ is well over 90% done on this walk down the aisle. I believe that any second we can hear the trumpet call of God, we can hear the voice of the archangel, and the rapture of the church is going to happen. You'll find that in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. They call it the catching away. Any second we could be there, and the scripture says that while this earth endures a seven-year tribulation, you and I, we're going to be at the wedding feast of the Lamb with our bridegroom. And then just like the bride and groom in the natural, they're going to leave that church. They're going to leave that reception with that bride dressed in white. They're going to go out and rule and reign over their lives. The scripture says you and I are coming back with him. We're going to be dressed in white. We're going to ride on white horses. You may not know how to ride a white horse or any horse, you know, but you're going to know how to then because you're going to have seven years to learn how. We're going to ride back with him and we're going to rule and reign with him right here on this earth, man. Jesus loves us so much. He wants to be with us. That's what he brought that fire for to live in us so that we would know him and get to know his ways so that we as the bride could get prepared just like a bride in the natural she gets prepared before the wedding that's what's happening in our lives right now jesus brought this kind of fire to earth when it says bring fire there the, the word in the greek is uh fiera fotia means to bring fire what that means is it actually means to cast fire or to throw fire. Jesus came to be this holy flamethrower, man. And it's, it's not literal fire, right? It's, it's spiritual fire. He's talking about bringing the burning, dynamic, exciting presence of God into the lives of people. He brought it, and now we help share it. Amen? Amen. I want to show you today from Scripture what that fire is and what it can do in our lives. We've almost, I got five points. We're going to go through five points. The first one is right here. We just touched on it. And it is, God's fire illustrates his dazzling presence. In the scriptures, God would uh, reveal himself sometimes through a physical representation. It's called a theophany. It's called a theophany. The most common theophany in scripture is fire. Now, Now, there are several definitive statements about God in scripture, right? God is love. God is spirit. You know, God is holy. But this is a symbol of God. Fire is a symbol of God. God's not fire. God is like fire. And so he uses that to symbolize his awesome presence. When God first spoke to Moses, right, he spoke out of the flame of the burning bush. Later, he appears to all the Israelites on Mount Sinai as fire on the mountain. Check this out from the book of Exodus 24, 17. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire. And can you imagine what a sight that must have been? There's something awesome about fire, something about fire that just gets our attention. There's no wonder God chose that theophany, the theophany of fire. Later, Moses would build the first tabernacle, right? Make the first sacrifice. And again, God reveals himself by fire right here. Uh, The book of Leviticus, chapter 9, verse 24. Fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed the burnt offering. When, when all the people saw it, they shouted for joy and fell face down. What about us today? Is the fire of God so visible in our life that when people see us, they just shout for joy? Hey, Bill, I'm glad you're here, man. Here comes the fire of God, man. Bill is bringing that in. 
Years later, Elijah, he stood on Mount Carmel, right? And he called on God then to send down fire again to burn the sacrifice. God showed up. He burns up the sacrifice. And Elijah defeats the 450 prophets of Baal. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1, the apostle John sees the glorified Jesus. And he later describes him as having eyes like blazing fire. The clearest explanation probably, though, of what Jesus is talking about when he says, I've come to bring fire, is found when, when people ask John the Baptist in the New Testament. Hey, they say, hey, John, are you the Messiah? John says, no. He says, look, let me tell you something. I baptize you with water, but one is more powerful than I. He will come, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Jesus came to baptize us in the Holy Spirit and in fire. He came to totally immerse us in the burning, purifying, awesome presence of God. That's why he came to bring fire on the earth. On the first resurrection day, the first Easter Sunday, right? The day that Jesus rose from the dead. Those two disciples, they're walking down the road to Emmaus, right? They're going from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Interesting, too, the scripture tells us, wants, to, wants us to know that Emmaus is exactly seven miles from Jerusalem. I know somebody's getting that right now. So they're walking down this road to Emmaus. Suddenly, Jesus is there with them. And it says that Jesus reveals to these guys everything in the scriptures from the very beginning right up till then to the day that he rises from the dead, that very day. And then he reveals himself to them. Man, they were astonished. As far as they were concerned, they were thinking with those worldly mindsets. As far as they were concerned, Jesus was dead and Jesus was buried. He reveals himself to them and then he disappears. One of them looks at the other one and says, were not our hearts burning within us as he spoke with us? Now, when your heart is on fire like that for someone, then you're totally passionate about that person. That's what Jesus brought fire for. He wants us to have that burning, passionate, love relationship with the God of the universe. And so since God is like fire, that means there's so many things that he wants to do in our lives that's like fire. And that brings us today to point number two. God's fire generates unlimited power. Again, this field that we call thermodynamics, this scientific field. You know, all of our cars have internal combustion engines, right? We put fuel in those things, and when we start them up, the pistons go up and down. That turns the drive shaft. That turns the axles. We go from point A to, to point B in our cars. Thermodynamics, right? I was talking to, to this friend of mine, Big Al. He lives up in uh, Philadelphia. I've talked about him before. We were comparing gas prices between Philadelphia and Cincinnati. We were talking about it. And Big Al, I just, I just love the way he thinks. He said, you know what, man? I'm going to invent a car that runs on hugs. <laughs> and it just made my day. I thought about that all day. And I thought, man, bless your heart, Big Al. I just love that. But thermodynamics, man, electricity is produced in power plants, right? Where they burn coal or they burn gas or their nuclear fusion. And it, it transforms heat into power so that you and I back at our homes, we plug in appliance. And again, that electrical current is transformed into some kind of energy. So for you and I, the day that we receive Jesus, when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, it's like spiritual thermodynamics. Check it out. Book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 8. You will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you. The, the Holy Spirit living in us is like the fire of God that generates the power we need to live the Christian life. Right? He gives us power to share the gospel, to share his word. He gives us power to forgive people you know, who have hurt us. He gives us power to love unlovely people, like unlovely people like me. <laughs> in, in, in our own strength. We can't live the Christian life. Look what Jesus says in the book of John, chapter 5, verse, or chapter 15, verse 5. He says, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. And I love that, too, because the scripture also says that Jesus is love. And then Jesus himself tells us, hey, you know what? Anything you do, you might think you're doing the greatest thing in the world. But if you do it and you don't do it in love, it's futile. It means nothing. In the book of 1 John, chapter 2, verse 20, John tells us, but you have an unction from the Holy One. See, the fire of God in our heart, His very presence in our heart, again, it's like a spark that generates that energy that you and I need. 
to live the Christian life, to live that holy kind of a life. John says we have an unction from the Holy One. The Holy Spirit is like our fuel. And so here's the key to spiritual thermodynamics right here. You can't function without the unction, right? We need to, we need to listen when the Holy Spirit urges us and prompts us and, and overwhelms us. He's our fuel. Fire in the natural. It's only going to burn as long as it has fuel and oxygen. If it runs out of either one of those things, it's going to burn lower and lower and lower. God, He is eternal, right? But the power that He gives to you and to me, we can't just take for granted that that power is always going to be blazing. We have to feed the fire. We have to tend the fire in order to keep it to, to its full potential. And again, we can look back to that temple you know, and to the altar there. And we can see what God told those Levitical priests. He said, the fire on the altar must be kept burning. It must not go out. Every morning, the priest is to add firewood and arrange the burnt offering on the fire. It's the same for you and I today. We have to arrange the firewood in our lives, right? We have to wake up in the morning. We need to be in prayer. If we have time, we should be in the Word. Maybe it's just listening to some really cool Christian music on our way to work. You know what I'm talking about here. That firewood that feeds that fire, that causes that fire to blaze up so we can go to our workplaces. We can be who we're supposed to be. Again, in the natural fire that's not tended, it's simply going to burn down. And the sad thing is, it can happen to you and I spiritually, and it can happen so easily. I mean, ask yourself today, has the flame in my heart been burning lower and lower? Was there ever a time that you were more excited and fired up for the Lord than you are now? Has the zeal and the passion in your life for the things of God, has that cooled down? You know, being cool, I always wanted to be cool, right, when I was growing up. Being cool, it used to be a good thing in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. How many of you remember this guy right here? Yeah, man, the Fonz, right? Hey, the Fonz, right? He was cool, and he, he kind of put all three of those decades together because the show was on in the 70s, and it was about the 1950s and the 1960s. He was the Fonz. To be cool, you, you never got in a hurry. You never got all excited, right? You never got passionate about anything. You just had to stand around and be kind of disinterested, right? You know, you just kind of hung out, had one hand in your jeans, you leaned back like this, and you just had to look kind of bored, you know? You're just cool. Man, you know? <laughs> yeah, you were just cool. But the problem is that in the body of Christ, we can't be cool. And I really think it's an issue in the body of Christ today. I think there's just too many cool Christians, and, and I think that that coolness kind of co causes compromise. Look what Paul said in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 10. He said, we are fools for Christ. In the body of Christ today, we've got too many people who want to be cool and, and who don't want to be fools for Jesus. Now, understand that when Paul says that, he's not saying that we go out and act like a bunch of lunatics, right? You know, I mean, we're not supposed to do that. But the, but the book of uh, 1 Peter tells us that the world looks at you and I as peculiar people. They think of us as fools. Why? Because we do the things that I said before. We forgive people who've hurt us. Man. We love unlovely people. We reach out to people. We're not vengeful. We don't covet things from our neighbors. And they look at us and they think, wow, you guys are just fools. You guys are, are just doormats. But that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about being so on fire for God that we're willing to do anything to reach someone for Jesus, to let people know about God's power. In many ways, we, we've replaced the, the fiery, dynamic Christian life for some sort of a mediocre, dispassionate substitute. Now, I'm not talking about us right here so much, but I'm talking about out there in the world. We have people across our nation right now who consider themselves to be Christians because they got baptized when they were a baby. They consider themselves to be Christians just because they were born in the United States of America or because their mother and father were Christians. We need to be on fire for Jesus. We need to let them know what Christianity is all about. In the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.19, Paul said, don't quench the spirit, right? We, we wouldn't put, we wouldn't put uh, water in the gas tank of, of our automobiles. So why do we water down God's power in our life? And I'm guilty of that, man. I've done that so many times. Spiritual fervor, it can be quenched or watered down by simple apathy. That's why, that's why God told those priests, hey, it's daily discipline to keep adding wood to the fire. 
If you and I neglect our quiet time, if we neglect that time of Bible study, that time of prayer, if we neglect that time being with other believers, worshiping God and being in God's word, we need to be in God's word alone and we need to be in God's word when we're together because God's word is true. God's word is true. It's the kindling for the fire in our heart. Understand, man, if we don't, if we don't do those things, our fire is simply going to dim down. Look, I'm not talking about losing your salvation here. You're not going to ever hear me preach that. You, you don't lose your salvation, but you lose the joy of your salvation. You lose your zeal. You lose your edge and you lose your fervor for the things of God. Without God's fire to light the way, it's so easy for the darkness to creep up on us. I've got this uh, uh, friend who's a pastor out in Adams County. And he has this small church. It's got like 50 people in his church, okay? And he's been there for about five years. He knows everybody in the church. He's in the grocery store one day. He's talking to this guy in line in front of him. And so after they talked for a while, they, they, he says, well, we introduced each other. And when he told him he was a pastor and where his church was, the guy said, hey, I'm a member of your church. And the pastor said, well, I've been there five years and I've never seen you there. He said the guy took a step back and looked at him and said, hey, I said I was a member, not some kind of fanatic. <laughs> It's really a true story. And through a little more conversation, what he figured out was that this man's idea of a Christian walk was, it was like being in the military. Line up, sign up, and enlist. He showed up one Sunday. He got, he got a membership form, filled it out, turned that thing in. Done deal. It was a done deal for him. But I have to tell you, man, when I get more concerned about being labeled a fanatic than getting on fire for Jesus, I know that something's wrong in my life. Check out this from Leonard Ravenhill. Leonard Ravenhill, was a, to me, was a 20th century prophet. He lived in England. He came to the United States. He never went back to England. He just lived and died here. He says, you may be little experiences and speak of the dangers of emotion, but we are suffering from a species of Christianity as dry as dust, as cold as ice, as pale as a corpse, and as dead as old King Tut. We are suffering not from a lack of correct heads, but from a lack of consumed hearts. See, in a lot of ways, we've taken God's word and we've intellectualized it. So many people know scripture today, but we don't need to just intellectualize it. We need to become impregnated by it. We need to live it, breathe it, walk it, let people see it, man. God never intended for his church to invert and become some sort of a deep freeze, right? When, when I get ready for church in the morning, I don't, I don't pull my clothes out of the deep freeze, out of the refrigerator, pull them out of the closet. But, but the church, it should be a place where a group of Christians come to celebrate God. A group of Christians who are already ignited for service, coming together to share their fire with each other. I mean, so many times I find myself these days stopping and saying, and what am I thinking? What am I talking about here? What am I doing? I have to put my hand over my heart and say, man, is that thing still warm? Is that thing still beating inside of there? Where have I been? What's going on? How have I allowed this to happen, God? You know, and if I feel like it's not warm and it's not beating, I know that it's God's way of telling me, hey, John, you need to reignite, dude. You need to stir those ashes of apathy. You need to reignite that zeal and that fervor. See, see, how do we do that? I mean, you ask yourself all the time, how do I do that, man? It seems like so much is piled up in front of me. That's just it. We've got to get rid of those things that are in the way. And that brings us to point Number three, God's fire eliminates our impure qualities. The Holy Spirit comes to live in our lives, right? The fire of God comes into our lives to make us holy. To be holy means to be pure and clean. Now, none of us are perfect, right? We're, we're a work in progress. That's what's going on here, right? But I have to tell you, I went to this meeting with a, with a group of uh, pastors, right? And they were from all around, not just in the city, but outside the city. And we had decided to come together, I got invited, because we were going to talk about things we could do to do that, to help ignite the spark, you know, in our church and bring our churches together, bring that fire together. But somehow as the meeting started, we got totally sidetracked and we began to talk about words. It was the strangest thing because we, we mentioned the Holy Spirit and someone said, well, you know, it's okay to say Holy Spirit, but we don't want to say the word holy too much. And I was like, well... You know, and, and they said, because you know what, that word sounds too churchy. 
And every time they would say church, they would do like, it sounds too churchy. And they would say things like, we don't want to say the word ministry because that bothers people. You know, we want to use different words in that. And the Holy Spirit began to just convict me. Hey, you know what's happening here? The enemy's just deceiving you guys. He's just keeping you guys busy. He's keeping you guys focused on things so that you're not being focused on the things that you need to be focused on. And so we began to talk. And finally, we began to, to other people began, I could tell, they began to kind of see this. They began to see this going on. And finally, someone just said, hey, you know what? Let's stop. Let's allow God to just purify this whole meeting. Let's allow God's presence to come in here and get where we're supposed to be. And we all agreed. All of a sudden, everybody was like, yeah, I don't know why this is going on. I don't know how we ended up in this kind of a conversation. But the devil, he'll try that. He'll try to deceive us as individuals. He'll try to deceive us as groups, as small groups, as, as churches, whatever we are. He wants to deceive us. He wants to keep us busy so that we're not allowing God in to purify us, so that we're not being about God's business. Malachi chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. It says, for he will be like a refiner's fire. Or a launder or soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify. Now because we're in the fire starter series, you probably think I'm going to jump right on that refiner's fire there, right? But I'm not. I'm going to jump on the launder or soap. See, because God's fire is like a launder or soap. And also because I used to own a dry cleaning business, right? I used to have a dry cleaning business. I had it for like seven years. I built that thing from the ground up. And periodically, people would come into the dry cleaners, and they would have a garment that had a stain on it. And they would come up to me, oh, thank you so much. Bless you, Nick. Wonderful servant of God right there. Thank you. Appreciate that. Ah, uh, just didn't want to quench the fire. I would have brought one up with me. No, I just kidding. <laughs> but anyway, people would come into the dry cleaner from time to time, right? And they'd bring a garment, and they'd have a stain on it. They'd say, hey, man, can you get this stain out? And I'd say, well, what is it? Well, I, I mixed mustard and mayonnaise and horseradish, and I put it on a big potato chip, and when I went to take a bite, it broke in half and fell on my shirt, right? So what we would do is we would take, we'd say, well, look, we'll try. And so we would go get mustard and ketchup and horseradish. We'd mix it together. We'd put it on some cloths, and we had all these chemicals and these brushes, and then we would work on that stain until we got it out, right? And we would agonize sometimes over getting that stain out because we were in business. You know, we wanted to be pleasing to our customers, right? We wanted them to come back. But once we got the stain out, what we did was we write it in a book. Hey, mustard, ketchup, horseradish, do this. This is what you do to get rid of that. It's the same with the stain of sin in our lives, with, with our past, right? We learn from it, but we don't have to live in that stuff. We don't have to walk in that day in and day out. We learn from it, but we don't live in it. In 1665, the residents of London were dying by the thousands because of the bubonic plague. A third of London's population, their whole population was wiped out. A third of their population, 30,000 people. Doesn't seem like a lot by today's standards, but still, a third of their population. <clears throat> the ra the uh, rats and fleas, you know, where it was unsanitary, and they were spreading the bubonic plague all over London. There was a famous nursery rhyme from that time period, and you guys probably all know it. It's a ring around the roses. It was about the bubonic plague. It said, ring around the roses, red rings were the first sign. Then a pocket full of posies. They believed if you put a little bouquet of posies in front of your nose and went out in public, you wouldn't breathe in the bubonic plague. And then they would say, tissue, tissue. It's supposed to be the sound of sneezing. They would say, tissue, tissue. That's where we actually get the name for tissue, you know, that we blow our nose in and all that. And then they say, we all fall down. The infected person would die. But on September the 2nd, 1666, the great fire of London broke out. All the structures in medieval London, they were wooden, so the whole all of London burned down. It took five days. Burnt everything down. But when the fire finally went out, what the people realized was that all the rats and the fleas and the unsanitary conditions had also burned up in the fire, and the bubonic plague was gone. The fire cleaned the city of the impurities that were killing everybody. They actually changed the end of the nursery rhyme from tissue, tissue, we all fall down, to ashes, ashes, they all fall down. Talking about the rats and the fleas. But, but that's what the fire of God can do in our lives too. It's a purifying, cleansing flame. The fire of God, it can come into our lives and it can cleanse us from impurities that we didn't even know were there. Most of you, I look at, from, I know everybody in here. Most of you guys know what it's like to go through the refining fire. You know, it's hot. It's uncomfortable. Maybe you're going through the refining fire right now. 
And you're saying to yourself, when is this going to end, God? I'm so tired of this. When's it going to stop? But I would tell you this. God is the great refiner. He knows us better than anyone. And he knows how much fire we need to cleanse us of those impurities. And as I was studying this, I was, I was Googling refiner's fire on the computer. And I found this lovely poem. Some of you may know it, but I wanted to share it with you. It's called The Refiner's Fire. They, they don't know who the author is. And this is what it says. It says, God sat by a fire of sevenfold heat as he placed in his precious ore. And closer he bent with a loving gaze as he heated it more and more. He knew he had ore that could stand the test. And he wanted the finest gold to mold as a crown for the king to wear, set with gems with a price untold. So he laid us as gold in the burning fire, though sure we would have told him nay. And he watched the dross that we had not seen as it melted and passed away. And our gold grew brighter and yet more bright, but our eyes were so dim with tears. We saw but the fire and not the master's hand, and we questioned with anxious fears. But he waited there with a watchful eye, with a love that is strong and sure, and his gold did not suffer a bit more heat than was needed to make it pure. Man, I just love that. I'll put that online. I'll, I'll get that online after the celebration today. But if God is taking you through that purifying fire right now, I would say this to you. Don't resist him. Trust him. Allow him to purify you of those habits and those attitudes that are keeping you from being pure gold for him. And, and when we allow God's fire to work in us like that, when we allow him to cleanse us like that, after we allow his fire to work in us, then his fire will work through us. Amen? Uh, point number four, God's fire captivates the attention of people. And it's so true. When we see something on fire, we just have to go watch, don't we? Something's on fire. We, should, we hear the fireman go down the road. Sometimes we follow him. Hey, man, I wonder where he's going. I wonder what's up. Or if we see a big billow of smoke out in the distance, sometimes we'll jump in our car and drive out there. Hey, we'll see what's going on, right? There was an oil well that caught on fire down in uh, Texas. This thing was burning out of control. A 10 alarm fire, man. The firefighters from Midland, Texas and Odessa, Texas came in with all their equipment, but none of them could get close enough to put out this fire. So they're all standing there watching this fire and the owner of the oil rig writes a check for $500,000. He said, I got a check here for $500,000 for anyone that can put the fire out on that oil rig. Right about that time, this old dilapidated fire truck from a place called No Trees, Texas. It's a place called No Trees, Texas. I looked it up. There's no trees there. That's why they call it No Trees, Texas. The No Trees, Texas Volunteer Fire Department comes down the road, goes right past all these fire trucks, these big time fire trucks, rolls to a stop in front of this oil rig. These guys jump out of this truck yelling and screaming. They hook up their hoses. Some of them are squirting out the fire. Other ones are squirting the ones that are squirting out the fire. But they put out the fire. They come walking back up the road totally disheveled. Their eyebrows are singed off. They're filthy. They're dirty. They're breathing hard. They're thirsty. And the owner of the oil well walks up to the chief, the fire chief from No Trees, Texas Volunteer Fire Department, and he hands him a check for $500,000. He stands there for a minute, and the chief's huffing and puffing, and he says, Chief, what are you going to do with all that money? And the chief said, well, the first thing I'm going to do is fix the brakes on that truck. <laughs> <laughs> Laughter. Just a little bit more of the fire of God, right? But, <laughs> but there is something about fire. We do. We want to go see it. We want to watch it burn. When I was a teenager, I worked in the barns down at River Downs Racetrack, right? I was an assistant to the groom. And you may remember from back in the 1970s, some of you may remember, the barns burned up down there. They were all wooden. There was hay and straw everywhere down there. It, it happened so fast. It came so fast and furious that they had us just run down and start opening stalls and shooing racehorses and other horses that were down there out of the, out of the barn area, right? I mean, for seven days, they were finding thoroughbred racehorses up and down the Ohio River. They changed the speed limit on 52, uh, Route 52, all the way to Moscow, Ohio. They changed the speed limit to 30 miles per hour because for seven days, horses were just walking out of the woods onto the road right in front of cars. It was amazing. But I remember a Catholic priest came down. The fire got to a point where it was just out of control, so we were all standing back. And a Catholic priest came down from the Catholic Church with some members of his church to see if he could aid people, you know, if there was anything that he could do for people. 
So we were all standing there watching the church, and I remembered this while I was writing this. He looked at the guy next to him, and he said, you know what, man? There's more people watching this fire burn than are going to be in church tomorrow. He said, there's 20 times as many people watching this fire is going to be in church tomorrow. And then he said, I guess if we want people to come, we just need to set the building on fire, you know? <laughs> and so I was, we all laughed, right? But I was thinking about that, and I thought, you know what? He, it, it's, he almost had it right. We don't want to set the building on fire. We want to set these temples right here on fire. Right? That's what happened that day at Pentecost. A group of Christians came together, they got on fire for Jesus, and another group of people came to check it out. You can read it in the book of Acts, chapter 2, the first four verses. It says, it says they came together, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire, right? Those tongues separated and came to rest on each of them. On each of them. And, and after that, people came and it said they came together in bewilderment. They were amazed, perplexed, and they asked one another, what does this mean? The folks in Jerusalem, they heard about it. They came to check it out. 3,000 people got saved that day. Two days later, 5,000 more people got saved. I mean, if we want to fulfill the Great Commission, we should need to get on fire for Jesus. Uh, 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 Charles Spurgeon, the great pastor and the great preacher, he said this to young preachers all the time. Build a fire with God's word and people will come to watch it burn. And that's good advice, not just for young preachers. Man, that's good advice for all of us, right? We're all called to a royal priesthood. I mean, that's what God's word does. I want our church to be a church on fire. I want the churches in our community to be churches on fire. I want the body of Christ around this world to be on fire for Jesus. Because if we're on fire, people are going to come in the multitudes to come and watch us burn. And hopefully they're going to find Jesus in the process. So let me ask you today, are we a church on fire? Or are we just an extremely warm church. You know, the warmth of friendship, it's not the same as the holy fire of God. I feel that in the body of Christ, I really feel this, that in the body of Christ, the major, the whole body of Christ around this world, that like I said before, there's so many people who consider themselves to be Christians who aren't Christians. They go out and they tell people that they're Christians. And then there's a lot of Christians too who set their spiritual thermostats so low that they orchestrate the Holy Spirit right out of their Christian walk. They're not walking in the spirit. They're more interested in being cool Christians rather than red hot servants for Jesus. And remember this too. From, from scripture. God doesn't light churches on fire. God lights individuals on fire. At Pentecost each individual had his own little flame. It was when they came together with those flames that they had a church on fire. See our church, the churches in our community, the body of Christ around this world going to be a body of Christ on fire when we all get on fire and then we come together. And, and understand, I'm not saying that we're not a church on fire. I love our church. I love this body. I love what we do here. But I am saying this. Beware. Don't let the enemy keep you busy with worldly things. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. And walk that thing out and then bring it together in here. Bring it together when you meet other believers out there. Start that kind of a fire. You know, it's easy to tell when somebody's on fire for Jesus. That brings us to point number five, because God's fire does that. It radiates through his servants, man. You, you can't, if you've got the fire of God in you, you can't keep it a secret. It's, it's like one of, those, one of those big iron bars. Raj and I, we used to work at the J.W. Harris Company, man. And they would put those big iron bars in those furnaces. And, and they'd pull those things out with those tongs. And those things would be glowing hot, you know. And that's what we need to be as Christians, you know. When we step out every day, we need to be glowing. Hot. Angels in scripture, they're described as having glowing faces because they're around God's glory. Moses, he wasn't even around God's glory. He saw the afterglow of God's glory. And, and his face shined so bright, they had to put a veil on it because they said it was hurting their eyes. Stephen, the first Christian martyr, man, he, he told the Sanhedrin, you guys killed the living son of the living God. They took him out outside of the city and stoned him to death. But it says that while they were stunning, they said he had the face of an angel. It's kind of, it's kind of a strange if you think about it. It's like they're stoning him to death and someone says, hey, look, he has the face of an angel. And I guess someone else said, yeah, give me another rock so I can hit it again. You know? I, mean, I mean, it doesn't make sense. But you know what? That, that's a great example of the other fire, the fire of the enemy. All you got to do 
is go home, turn on your TV, fire up your computer, open your newspaper, and you see that kind of senseless insanity going on around our world today. Murder that doesn't make any sense. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just totally crazy out there. That's why we need to be on fire for God. Because we need to be spreading the real fire. The enemy's fire, it can't even hold up to God's fire. We need to be out there speaking God's truth. We need to be out there praying for people, loving people, laying hands on people, being who we're called to be. We need to be out there and be those glowing witnesses for Jesus. We need to be red hot for Jesus. That's why Paul told Timothy this. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. Now, my mom's old neighbor, my mom, she had this neighbor, and her neighbor moved, and he had this huge wood-burning stove, right? And, and uh, he couldn't take it with him, so he gave it to me. So I took that wood-burning stove, and I had it installed in my house. And we used to burn in that thing on those cold winter days, right? And, and uh, uh, we would actually, it was so hot, we would have to turn off the, the furnace, and we'd get really hot. And then the next day, I'd wake up, you know, I'd, I'd be upstairs, I'd wake up, I'd come down. It was freezing cold in that room. And I'd open up that stove and there'd just be this like mat of ashes down in the bottom of that stove, you know. So I'd look at it for a few minutes and then I'd take that poker and I'd stir those ashes. <sighs> that thing just burst into flame. And so I'd grab some firewood and I'd throw that firewood on there. And that, that stove would just start pumping again, man. Just start pumping out the heat. But that's the way we need to be in our lives too. We need to allow God to stir up those ashes of apathy. If we're not stirred from time to time, we're going to become cold and carnal. We need to reignite the fire of God inside of us, man. Church, remember this. We need it for power. We need the fire of God to stay pure. And we need the fire of God to be those kind of Christians that attract others to God. And then we need that fire to be those kind of a Christians that after they're attracted to God, that we're there with them, that we're there for them. Like I said, we don't need to be go-to people. We need to be go out and do it people. That's what we need to be. That's what the fire of God will do in us. You know, I, I, I made these comparisons today between the temple of God in the Old Testament and the altar with the fire on it there and the fact that you and I are the temples of God today. I want to share this with you from 2 Chronicles chapter 7. It says, this is when Solomon dedicated his temple. It said it was most beautiful of all the temples. It says, when Solomon finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. It says, when all the people saw the fire of God coming down, the glory of the Lord, they knelt on the pavement with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped. And it says the people saw the fire of God. So what about in us today? Are they seeing the fire of God in us? Solomon's temple was supposed to be the most beautiful temple. You know what? These temples are made in God's image. There's nothing more beautiful than you. Your temple, man. It needs to be a temple on fire because people are watching you. You're the bride of Christ. They don't know the bridegroom, man. Their eyes are on you while you're walking down that aisle. God has this major plan and this major purpose for our lives. In the Old Testament, again, God had a temple for his people. Today, God has people who are his temple. We need to allow that fire to fall in these altars, inside these temples. So question number one today, got to ask it, man. I ask it all the time. Has the fire of God been kindled inside of your heart today? Have you given your life to Jesus? You know, sometimes people say nowadays, well, you know, the, the time for those altar call things in church is time from the past. But I have to tell you something. I disagree with that. I totally disagree with that because when we come to church, we bring God's word. And God's word is God's truth. And God's truth starts a fire in people. If we let people leave without making that call, they can go right back out into that dark, damp world 
And like I said, simple apathy can quench that fire that's been started in their hearts. And so I ask you today, if that's you, if you haven't given your life to Jesus and you want to give your life to Jesus, then everybody else that's a believer in this room has been right where you're at. And so I want to ask you if your heart's palpitating a mile a minute right now and you're saying, that's me, i got to give my heart to Jesus. You raise your hand, I'll pray with you right now to receive Jesus. You can go home and do it in your bedroom. You can do it in your kitchen. You can do it in the parking lot at Sears, man. It doesn't matter. God will hear you wherever you're at, wherever you invoke the name of Jesus. But I'll pray with you right now. Would there be one today? Would there be anyone? Amen. And that means I am looking at a sea on fire, right? A sea of fire out there. Praise God. So question number two. Are you keeping the fire that's in you blazing? Again, how do we do that? First, we have to admit that the fire is low. Next, we have to refuse to be cool, apathetic believers. And finally, we simply have to ask God, God, stir us up today. You can see the altar team is already up here. Amen. Brother Carl has brought the altar team up here. They're going to be up here for any prayer needs. If you need your fire stirred, man, I want you to come up and I'm going to pray before we dismiss. I just love that song that uh, Craig played before, uh, allowed me to sing with him even. Wow, what a treat, amen. So Father, we thank you today for your fire. Jesus, you told us that you came to bring fire, and we're so happy you did, Lord. Lord, forgive us for those times where we allow the fire to dim down, Lord. We don't want it to be that way, Lord, but we can get so caught up in, in things and in stuff of the world out there. But we know that you're with us every step of the way down the aisle, Lord. Lord, we can look ahead to a glorious, great, eternal future with you, Lord. We're so happy that our loved ones who have left here are with you, Lord. We're so happy, Lord, that they were on fire for you and that they shared that fire with us, Lord. And that now we can share with our loved ones, with our friends and our neighbors and with just people out there. Lord, stir the ashes in us today, Lord. And then throw your firewood on us, Lord. Whatever you want, we want to be a part of it. Whatever your will is, we want to walk in it today, Lord. We love you so passionately. We love you with that burning, passionate kind of love. You've opened our eyes to your truth, Lord. And we are on fire for you. So, Lord, bless your people as they go out. They are willing servants, Lord, my brothers and sisters. Use them in a mighty, mighty way, Lord. And that when we come back next week, we'll bring these fires back together. And we'll grow and we'll share till the day you call us home, Lord. We thank you. In Jesus' holy and mighty name. Amen. 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 You are dismissed, church.